Okay, this fall we are starting uh, a new series of Sunday messages called Becoming Like Jesus. Becoming Like Jesus. And the reason why we've made this the uh, theme and focus um, is because that is God's plan and purpose for our lives, folks. If you've ever wondered, what is God's plan for my life? That's it right there. That's it. It's simple. Uh, listen to what it says in Romans 8.29. Paul writes, for those that God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Right? God's plan and purpose is that we all be tr conformed to the image of of his son Jesus so that there might be many who bear his image who bear the family likeness as it were and we see in Genesis you know that when God created mankind we were created in his image weren't we in the likeness of God but when our first parents rebelled against God and his purpose for our lives that image was shattered it was shattered it became distorted by sin. And so it's like looking in a broken mirror. And yet, instead of throwing us all into the trash, God, in his love, already had a plan to restore his image in us. He had a plan to send his son Jesus to redeem us and to fill us with his spirit so that we might become like him so that God's image would be restored in us. So we would once again be his image bearers. And we know what his image looks like. Because we can look at Jesus, who it says in Colossians 1 is the image of the invisible God. He is the image of the invisible God. So if you want to know what the image of God looks like in a man, or in a woman, we just need to look at Jesus. Because not only is he God, but also as a human being, he was exactly, he is exactly how God intended man to be in the beginning. Right? He is the truest human being to have ever lived. So for us, it means becoming like Jesus is to become more fully human. And when we human beings act in ways that are contrary to the nature of Jesus, we are behaving in subhuman ways. Which is why hate and violence, lying, cheating, greed, selfishness, and so on, they all contribute to the dehumanization of society. And it's why Christians should automatically stand out as different. It's why the first followers of Jesus were called Christians, because the word literally means little Christs. But the problem we have today, and especially in our culture, is that there are many people who call themselves Christians, but who don't look much like Jesus. The way they talk and act, their attitudes, their character, it just doesn't reflect the Jesus that we see in the Bible. And that is a big problem. Because we've been commissioned by Jesus to go and make disciples by teaching them to follow his ways. In other words, to see many more people conform to his image. But that cannot happen unless we ourselves are being conformed to his image. Right? Because making disciples means reproducing ourselves. I had a stepdad who always used to say to me, don't do as I do, do as I tell you. I've got news for you. That doesn't work. It doesn't work. Christians need to look like what they're talking about. I read this uh, quote 
uh, this week from a former Muslim um, who became a Christian and a pastor. His name was Iskandar Jadid. He's no longer alive, but in one of his books, he made this statement. If all Christians were Christians, that is Christ-like, there would be no more Islam today. It's quite a statement. What do you think this country would look like if all Christians were Christians? In other words, they looked like Christ. They had the same attitude as Christ. Well, that is why we're doing this series, Becoming Like Jesus, because it's God's purpose, you see, not just for our lives, but for the sake of all the others he's wanting to bring into his family. Now, I realize that one sermon series is not going to suddenly make us like Jesus. Becoming like Jesus is an ongoing, lifelong process. But God's word is a vital and important part of that process. Because God's word is living, it's active, it it has power to change our attitudes and our behavior as we submit to it, as the Holy Spirit causes it to penetrate our hearts and our attitudes, our minds. You know, it's through the word that the Spirit reveals God's will to us. It's through his word that our minds are renewed as we come to know Jesus more. And so we're gradually transformed into his likeness. God's word is vitally important in that process, which is why we don't just preach his word on Sundays. We also encourage one another with God's word, including in our community groups. And in a minute, Gareth is going to tell us a bit more about our plans for that this fall. But before he does, let me just say something about community groups, which in our church are small groups of about 5 to 12 people who meet regularly for fellowship, to look at scripture, pray for one another, and hopefully to encourage each other to be a witness for Christ. The early church seemed to have a similar practice, where we're told that they met all together, right in the beginning, they met all together in the temple courts, a bit like we're doing here, but also, it says, in their homes. And I want to argue that just as God's word is vitally important to the process of becoming like Jesus, so is some form of small group community. Because becoming like Jesus is not something that can happen in isolation. It's not something that we can do alone. All right? We need one another. We need the rest of the family. As John Stott, the Bible commentator, commented, he said, like, he said, becoming like Christ is the purpose of God for the people of God. Right? The context for becoming like Christ is the people of God. God may call us individually, but never as mere individuals. When he calls us to himself, he calls us into community. And we don't get to choose who is part of that community any more than you get to choose the members of your family. There are people in our families who we may love to spend time with. We may enjoy their company. But if your family is anything like mine, then there's family members you may not enjoy so much. You may want to avoid uncles and no, sorry, family. Not talking about you guys. There's a whole row of my family there, and I'm sorry. You guys, we, I love you guys. That's why we're in America. I left that family behind. Uncles and aunts and siblings and cousins who might annoy you. They may irritate you. So when it comes to Thanksgiving Day, you might find yourself saying to your mum, Mum, please don't sit me next to Uncle Frank. He's always letting off gas and blaming the dog and he's disgusting. I won't enjoy my Thanksgiving dinner if you sit me next to Uncle Frank. 
Maybe you've got an Uncle Frank in your family. Maybe you are Uncle Frank. <laughs> it's the same in the church family. Just look at the people you're sitting next to. And I'm not just talking about attending a meeting each Sunday where we tolerate one another for an hour or so and call that church. Tolerating people that you can't relate to or you might find difficult may be a good starting point, but it's not what church is about. And it's not the church that Jesus is wanting to build. Right? We're not just called to put up with one another, but to love one another. Remember? Remember? That's what Jesus said. This is how people will know that you're my disciples. He said, if you love one another, you see, that's what distinguishes us as being Christians. It's got nothing to do with how you vote. It's how you love. If you will love one another in the way that I have loved you, says Jesus, with all your failings and all your deficiencies, see, that's when we'll be start becoming more like Jesus. But for that to happen, it requires more than just coming together for a Sunday meeting. In Ephesians 4.16, the Apostle Paul says this. He says, from him, the whole body, from Christ, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Right? If we are going to grow up to look like Jesus then each member has to play their part in loving each other, which can only happen if our church community starts to look like the body that Paul is describing there, where every part is needed and interconnected and kind of relying on and supporting one another in love, in love. And surely that must mean being committed to some form of small group community where that can be put into practice. You know, for the last few years, Emma and I have participated in a small group, a community group. We're in Rachel's group. We don't lead it. We're just members like you. Because uh, we're no different to anyone else here, right? We need to grow up to be like Jesus, just like everyone else. But if I'm honest... When it's time to get off the couch and go to community group, my selfish flesh would much rather stay home and watch TV. I'm sure others of you have felt the same way. But community group is where we grow. How so? Because it's where we put into practice, you see, the biblical exhortations to serve one another, encourage one another, build each other up. It's where we can pray for others' needs. It's where we ourselves can receive prayer when we are in need. I mean, how else are you putting into practice Jesus' command to love one another? There has to be a context for that. And not just with a group of friends, but with people from different backgrounds, with different personalities, with different degrees of maturity, people who may be needy, people who may be different, people who may annoy you. That's what Christian love is about, isn't it? It's not enough just to hang out with friends and say, yeah, we love one another. No, even the pagans do that, said Jesus. The church is supposed to be different to the world. There's a commitment to loving people who are not like us. But where does that happen? Unless we're committed to gathering in close proximity to others, like in a small group community. You see, that is the soil that Christ-likeness grows in. The fruit of the Spirit grows in us as we're rubbing shoulders with other imperfect people. Love. Come on, say it with me. Love. Joy. Self-control. Those things don't grow in a vacuum. If we're going to become like Jesus and grow in patience and self-control, we need people who are going to test us in that. People we can practice on. 
Listen, building relationships in community is uncomfortable at times. It's inconvenient, but it's essential if we're going to grow up to be like Jesus. We need one another. And because it's central to God's plan, we need to orientate our lives around being in community rather than to orientate things around me and my selfish desires. We become more and more like Jesus as we learn to truly love and appreciate others who are different to us or who we may find difficult to love. And we become more and more like Jesus when we learn things about ourselves that cause us to change, and especially when you come to realize that you are Uncle Frank after all. <laughs> As Scott Sores wrote last, last quote, membership in a local church means joining your imperfect self to many other imperfect selves to form an imperfect community that through Jesus embarks on a journey towards a better future together. Together. So can I encourage you, if you're not already participating in a community group, please consider joining one. We have groups that meet at different times across the seacoast. If you are a small group leader or a co-leader, can you just stand quickly? Yeah, come on. We want to thank you. And youth group leaders, youth group, you're part of it. Yeah, we want to thank you for all the work you do in serving our church. So half of them are away. Where are they, Henry? Oh. Can you also let us know what group you're currently attending or which group you might be interested in attending if you're not in one by registering here? You can do that right now if you want. You can get out your phone. You can... You can register right now while Gareth is talking. <laughs> but I will send you an email this week with a link in case you're in, unfamiliar with QR codes. But you can register. It just means giving us your name and email. Let us know what group, select which group you're in or that you're interested in joining. And if for some reason nothing on offer is going to work for you, please get in touch with any of the leaders in your congregation and let's see what we can work out. All right, can we give please a warm welcome to Gareth who's going to come and tell us what's going to be going on in those community groups. Thank you. Ian told me I had 40 minutes, so uh, <laughs> uh, I just cut a chunk out uh, to get it down to 29 minutes, but we'll be good. No, I'll be quick. I am really excited to be uh, announcing this series that we're going to start in our community groups pretty much from next week. We have booklets uh, which have all the key information in them, which will be coming out to you during the course of the next week. So you'll have all of that before the groups start the following week. Um, and this morning, I want to talk a little bit about how the studies are going to work, and then I'm going to talk about a little tiny bit about an introduction to Paul's letter to the Ephesians, which sort of tells you why we're studying that book at this time. Um, but to start, I just want to talk about why we need to study the Bible. For over 2,000 years, countless lives all over the world have been affected and transformed by the message of the Bible. It's the world's best-selling book, and it always has been. It's been translated into more than 200 languages, and it is considered by serious scholars and historians, both believers and non-believers alike, to be the foundational text for Western civilization. Such is its authority and impact those opposed to it still try to destroy and forbid access to this book. It's still illegal to own or read the Bible in more than 50 countries. The Bible stands in a class of its own compared to any other literature. So how come so many of our Bibles lie on our bookshelves gathering dust. Why is it that Bible study can feel to be so hard? Why is it difficult to establish a regular pattern of devotional Bible study? Maybe it's busy lives, misplaced priorities, 
Or maybe it's the enemy sowing doubts about the Bible's relevance or its reliability. We all face challenges in persevering with studying the Bible. And that's one of the reasons we want to do it in community together. We want to help each other. We want to stir one another. We want to challenge one another to give the Bible its due together. To help each other as we hear God speaking to us, one and all. Because we can all hear God as we encounter his word together. And when we think about studying the Bible, and I'm going to get a little bit kind of, here's some advice. This is more like the infomercial part now, okay? This is how we plan to do the study over the fall. It's going to be a combination of things you do during the week or weeks, and then a discussion time all together in your groups reacting to those things. So we want to give you a little bit of a structure that you can follow. Now, if you are a seasoned Bible scholar and you have your hermeneutic framework absolutely nailed down, you can take a break right now. Okay, so anybody else... Please listen to what I'm now going to say because I want to be helpful in a, a process that we can follow that will help us to actually study together. And there's a guy called Eric Raymond who's a writer for the Gospel Coalition and he came up with this really helpful acronym to follow. So I want us to, to follow this. It's called CRAM. And CRAM stands for Character of God, Responsibility, Attitude and Actions, and meditation. And I was actually listening to what Ian, I was listening to him, what he just said. And he used most of these words in his talk about study today. You're going to hear a lot about cram over the next few months. So I want to encourage you to follow this process. Now, it does not cover everything you would need to do an exhaustive expositional Bible study, but it will help you to grow in your relationship with Jesus in three ways. Firstly, with your head, that's your intellect, as you work out what does this passage mean. Secondly, with your heart, that's your emotions, as you understand what has the passage got to say to you personally. And thirdly, with your hands, that's your actions. What do I need to do in response to this passage? In her commentary on Ephesians, which is excellent, by the way, Lynn Kohick explains that the believer grows and develops through actively engaging head, hearts, hands, and feet because the content of the study is not a body of literature, but a person, namely Jesus. So the first thing to do when you are embarking on Bible study, whether it's the first time ever, or whether this is something you've been doing for a long time, is to find a place where you won't be interrupted. Some folks like a silent place. Others, like me, prefer background music. The important thing is that you find a place where you can focus, think, and pray without interruption. Once you've got your location sorted out, set a time for the study, and when that time comes, this is the get off the couch bit, go to that place, take your Bible, a notebook, and a pen, or a computer if you prefer to do it that way, and get going. Now, I want to encourage you, please don't think you've got to study for hours. 10 to 15 minutes on a regular basis is way better than planning an hour or two hours and then never getting to do it. It's much more important to do the studying than to do long studies. Begin with prayer. Always start with prayer. It's amazing what the Holy Spirit wants to do in and through you as you read the word. If you just start reading it, sure, that's great, but it's so much better to thank God first for his word and ask the Holy Spirit to help you, to guide you, to teach you. Ask him to reveal God to you as you read his word and ask him to help you to remain focused and attentive. So let's look at these, let's look at cram. First of all, C, character of God. The main reason we study the Bible is to encounter God and to strengthen our relationship with him. 
So read through the passage a couple of times. Don't just go all the way through, oh, done. Read through it a couple of times at your normal reading pace. And the passages that we're studying, they're not very long. They're like a half a page at the most. Read it through at your normal reading pace, then read it again a little more slowly. And as you do that, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you, what is the big idea about God that Paul wants to communicate in this passage? What does it teach me about God or what he does? Maybe it's something about his attributes, his promises, or his providence. And it can be so tempting when you're reading the Bible at this point to go straight to, well, what does this mean to me? What do I think about this? How do I apply this in my life? Don't do that. Just stop for a moment and ponder, what does this passage tell me about God? Because that's going to keep you focused on the author of the book rather than on yourself. And it will also help you when you move on to the next stage to be looking through a God-centered lens as you think about how it speaks into your own life. And at that point, write down anything that the Holy Spirit shows you about what it's telling you about God. And by the way, write it down because you're going to find that really useful in the community group when we get into the discussion time. Secondly, responsibility. So once you've spent some time thinking about how God has revealed himself in the passage, begin to think about, what does it mean for me? Does God require something from me in this text? Does it contain a command that directly relates to me? Or does it include something that's been modified somehow by some other scripture? So, for example, the writer to the Hebrews tells us that all the commands that God gave to his people Israel in the Old Testament were fulfilled in Christ. So when we look at those commands, we need to look at them through the lens of what Christ has achieved, rather than thinking, oh, I now need to do that because God told the Israelites to do that. Think about what it might mean to you, and again, jot down anything that he tells you. Thirdly, attitude and action when we read the Bible as believers we don't just want to increase our knowledge about God we want to be transformed by our encounter with him we want to grow closer to him we want to experience his love and become more like him that means we need to allow our hearts and not just our minds to be exposed to the light of scripture. So as you ponder God's character and the implications of the passage, give the Holy Spirit permission to work in your life, revealing your inmost behaviors and actions and attitudes. Talk to him. This, if you've not done that before, it's gonna feel very vulnerable and maybe even a little uncomfortable but if you do that, if you give the Holy Spirit permission to talk into your life, to reveal things to you, he will begin to work deep in your heart, encouraging you and challenging you. He's also going to start to convict you about areas of your life that need to change. And this is the process of connecting the dots between God's character and the responsibility we have with our, in our lives at the deepest level. As you do that, again, write these things down. Thank him for what you're discovering about yourself, even the things you don't like. Because he's going to be right there with you, helping you, cheering you on as he works in your life to transform you so that you become more and more like Jesus. And the final step in the process is to meditate on the implications of the passage for your life. Now, there is a really important point to consider at this stage. You might have discovered areas where your life does not live up to God's expectations. And you might be thinking, I've done it again. 
I've fouled up again. I've messed up again. I've fallen short. I need to do better. I need to buckle up and just work really hard and get this done. And oh God, you must be so fed up with me because I've failed again. If you're thinking that way, you are in danger of falling for moralism and what the Bible calls works-based righteousness. That's where we try to impress God with our good efforts, where we try to make things better, where we try to win God's favor by somehow doing better than we previously did. It never works. It never, ever works. There is a much better way to respond to the scriptures. And it's actually the way God wants us to respond. It's the way of grace through the cross. As you meditate on the implications of the passage for your life, first consider Jesus and all that he's done for you. Ask God to help you to trust and treasure Jesus more. As you come to appreciate what God requires from you from the passage and just how far away from that you are, don't give up because of your failures or make a resolution to do better. Cast your gaze onto Jesus. When the Holy Spirit reveals our shortcomings in his words, it's so he can point us to Jesus, the source of our forgiveness, our salvation, and our life, and the source of the power to live out that new life. We can't do it on our own. We will just continue to fail after fail after fail until we see that he is the source of our righteousness. He is the one that paid the price for our sin. He is the one unto whom it was all put, and he is the one in whom we find life. Practically speaking, take one of the passages or verses that, that the Holy Spirit has caused to stick out to you. Write it down or memorize it. Keep it with you through the day. Turn the words over in your mind as you're going about your daily job and let the Spirit speak to you through them. Meditate on how Jesus meets the needs of that passage. Ponder on the truth that your life is hidden in him. So in him, you meet it because of him. You're covered by his righteousness. You're forgiven. And you've been empowered by the Holy Spirit to live out this new life. So ask God to strengthen you and reveal to you what he wants to do in and through you to be changed. And that's it. That's the process that we want to follow over these next few months. We'd love us all to be doing this together. Just think about what a difference it is going to make over the next few months as the Holy Spirit is given permission to work collectively in our lives as we go through this study together. So let me finally just quickly mention why we chose Ephesians. Bible translator Eugene Peterson used to tell a story of his four-year-old grandson jumping into his lap, begging his grandfather, tell me a story, Grandpa, tell me a story and put me in it. That's what Paul is doing in this letter to the church in Ephesus. He's telling the ultimate story, God's story, and he's putting us, he's putting us into it. That's everybody who follows Jesus is a part of this story. Paul wrote to the Ephesians back in AD 61-62 to a group of churches in what was called the province of Asia, of which Ephesus was the capital. And it's a short letter. It's just six chapters, 15 minutes it takes to read all the way through it. But man, is it power-packed. He manages to, to review all the major themes of the gospel, together with all the implications of those themes on believers. If I can mention Lynn Kohick again, she commented that in Ephesians, Paul narrates a plot 
that begins before the creation of the world, continues with God's redemption of his people from sin and the creation of a new people in Christ and promises eternal fellowship with God and fellow believers. The climax of the narrative is the revealing of God's mystery, the Messiah, who establishes the kingdom of Christ and of God, who redeems sinners for God and who creates a new people in himself, the body of Christ. It's breathless, even reading about it. Paul presents a combination of the Christian faith and the Christian life. And its central theme, according to John Stott, is God's new society, the church. In fact, Stott claims that nobody can emerge from a careful reading of Paul's letter to the Ephesians with a privatized gospel. For Ephesians is the gospel of the church. It sets out God's eternal purpose to create through Jesus Christ a new society which stands out in bright relief against the somber background of the old world. God's new society, that's us, is characterized by life in place of death, by unity and reconciliation in place of division and alienation, by the wholesome standards of righteousness in place of corruption and wickedness, by love and peace in place of hatred and strife, and by unremitting conflict with evil against a flabby compromise with it. I love that phrase, a flabby compromise. Do you want to be a flabby compromiser? Yeah, isn't there, is there anything worse to be called than a flabby compromiser? Paul explains what the church is, how it came into being, how it grows, how believers are to live lives worthy of it, and how it will ultimately be consummated by Christ when he returns to present his bride to himself. That's us as a radiant church without blemish, but holy and blameless as he puts it. It is such a cool book. You got it? You're going to come? Yeah? Okay. Through Christ, Paul says, God, God breaks down the walls of hostility to bring together enemies, and through these former enemies, establishes peace. Only God can do that through nothing less than a multi-generational, multi-ethnic diverse society, a single new humanity. This is such a critical word to our polarized society today. Ephesians talk strongly against expressive individualism and it tackles the individualistic cultural influences that affect each and every one of us by revealing the beauty of the community of Christ. And that's us. So I want to encourage you, please join us this fall. We are going to have such a good time. Thank you. Amen. So we've printed the study guides. There's one for everyone here. We also have them in Spanish. A uh, big thank you to Vivi for translating this morning. Our next uh, celebration altogether will be a Thanksgiving celebration November 24th. But until then, don't forget our prayer meetings this week. We're praying for revival. We're praying for an awakening, a spiritual awakening in our nation. Uh, we have a slide for that. This Tuesday, Wednesday, Tuesday in Summersworth, Wednesday here in Portsmouth. Uh, let's all gather together. Let's stand, please. Lord, we just thank you for your presence with us. We thank you for all that you've planned for us, for our church, for our lives, our families, Lord, for the communities we live in. We thank you for all that you have planned, and we pray for your purposes to be fulfilled through us. Lord, thank you that you have blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Lord, now help us to go and to be a blessing to those around us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.